little spot that I, I missed in our, our series on purpose. But uh, here in Hebrews 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 20, it says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the uh, Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. And by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So there's this little boy named Dermot. I don't know who names their kid Dermot, D-E-R-M-O-T. But that's the way the story is. And he was in a Sunday school play, and he's up on stage, and he has forgotten his lines. Luckily, his mother is right there in the front pew, and she's mouthing the words. And he has lost everything. He cannot decipher. He does not read lips. And finally, she leans forward and whispers the cue, I am the light of the world. And then he straightened up and he beamed and he's feeling great. And with a loud, clear voice, he announced, my mother is the light of the world. <laughs> and so we believe that. And uh, in the newspaper this week, we see the oldest light of the world. A mother has died. She is 114 years old. She is the oldest American, and she passed away, and she's a mother of three. And I found this little article in the B, and here's what it says about this mother. Her name is Delphine Gibson. It says, although she was blind and near death, near, and, and nearly deaf, excuse me, uh, at the end of her life, she still enjoyed singing and humming songs like Amazing Grace. Then I read on. She, only, she took no medication except a single multiple vitamin one day, every day. How about that? But she had an amazing spirit, they said. She was always singing to us or sharing the gospel. So this was a Christian mother, and she lived to be 114, indeed a light to the world. And what we see in her example and in so many other examples is that faith is to be a lifelong companion. Not a weekend guest, but every day we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is a critical course in the life as of a Christian. It's not an elective, something that we consider optional. No, faith as we have defined it is the belief in the existence of God and that God cares for us and that he has a good future in store for us. A future we cannot see. But we believe in faith that it is good and that God exists. And so today, where can we be most exposed to this contagious germ of faith? And the answer is, very clearly for this message, is the family. The family. Chuck Swindoll says the family is the bottom line of life, the anvil upon which attitudes and convictions are hammered out. It is the place where life makes up its mind. And it's so much better if there's faith in that family. So I say to you that the single most influential force in our lives continues to be our family. And when I wrote that, I said, is it? I said, even in today's culture, with so many digital media messages, I mean, we are constantly bombarded by everything. But is the family still the most influential force in our lives? I read a statistic about digital media messages. And it is the language of our culture. Everybody's on their phone all of the time. And uh, so it says that, in fact, a Christian teenager will engage almost 65,000 hours of digital media messages compared to only 800 hours of church teaching by the time they are 17. 65,000 hours on media versus 800 hours of teaching here at the church. So I think it's very important that the family intervene the family has more influence on the child's faith than, than the church even. 
So no price tag can adequately reflect the value of family. No gauge can measure its ultimate significance for good or even for ill. It is the place to cultivate and teach and learn the faith. At home, among your family members, is the place where the rubber meets the road, where we face reality together and we learn to deal with the ups and downs of life. How? With faith. And so this morning, with that in mind, let us think about three biblical homes where faith is being served up family style. And the first family mentioned in our text was Isaac's family. It says, by faith, the key operative word, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. So who was Isaac? He was the one and only son of Abraham and Sarah. Remember, they got pregnant in their 90s. Talk about a miracle, right? And they had this son, Isaac. And everything depended on Isaac because God had told Abraham and Sarah that you're going to have descendants like the stars of the uh, uh, heavens and the sand of the seashore. And they had one son. And he better be productive, right? Or it all stops and ends there with him. And Isaac had twins, Esau and Jacob. Now, if you know anything about the family of Jacob, it was, mildly put, a dysfunctional family. It was really not a very healthy family whatsoever. And I don't want to dwell on the negative in that story, and you can read all about how crummy of a person Jacob really was. Uh, his name means deceiver, liar, <laughs> cheater. That's what the kind of guy he was. But he still passed on the faith. So hear that. In the midst of all of that dysfunction, the faith got passed on. And so you can read about it in Genesis 27 and 28, this intimate moment where he, Isaac, is now very old. He is nearly blind. The time for his life on earth is coming to a close. And he is remembering what his father Abraham had told him, that God spoke to him, that God told his family to move to this unknown place. And they lived in that unknown land as, as immigrants, as strangers, as aliens. And, and God had promised that land to them, and yet they never inherited it just yet. And that those descendants would uh, number again the stars of the uh, uh, heavens and the sand of the seashore and eventually be a blessing to the whole earth. And we know that blessing was fulfilled in Jesus Messiah. But they didn't know that then. All of this was seen by faith. So here's Isaac. His physical eyes are failing, but he could see the future as promised by God, that he believed in God. He believed in God's promises. And so he took, takes his two sons and he blesses them. Now, Jacob is the second twin born. You know, just a few minutes later, he was born. But he got the firstborn blessing because time before, Esau came in hunting from hunting one day, and he was so hungry that he was starving. He wanted food, and Jacob had a big bowl of a pot of oatmeal or porridge there, and, and he negotiated with him, and Esau sold his birthright to his brother Jacob. And so Jacob got the blessing of the firstborn because Esau did not value it. And Jacob was blessed with heaven's dew and earthly riches. Jacob will become a great nation, this blessing went on. A nation chosen by God, a nation that other nations would look up to and serve, a nation that would eventually bless the whole earth. So this is a blessing between father and sons. So I want you to take a moment and reflect on your memories of your parents. And you too may have imperfect memories of your parents, okay? And let's just own that. All of our families are dysfunctional in some way, okay? Can we just own that? <laughs> there are no perfect families. But I ask you, were your parents godly in any sense of the word? And did they pass on to you any measure of faith whatsoever. They don't have to be perfect to do that, but did they do that for you? Yesterday at our men's breakfast, we had one of our men share the fact that his parents were divided in that. His father was not in his life very much at all, and he wasn't a man of Christian faith. No faith at all. But he says, I was in church from the day I was born. 
all the way through it. He says, I can't remember when I wasn't connected. And it was because of his mother's faith that he was able to articulate that faith. It came through his mother, not through his father. So I don't know in your family if it came through a parent. Then if it did, thank God for that blessing of faith. Now we want to look at grandparents. And I found this little poem about grandmothers particularly. It's written by an eight-year-old, it says. An anonymous eight-year-old says, and you know, kids say these funny things about their parents and their grandmothers. But she says, uh, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, but a grandmother is a lady who has no children of her own. So she likes other people's boys and girls. And grandmas don't have anything to do except be there. If they take us for walks, they slow down past leaves, pretty leaves and caterpillars. They never say, hurry up. Usually they are fat, but not too fat to tie shoes. I'm quoting. <laughs> they wear glasses and sometimes they can take their teeth out. <laughs> and they can answer questions like why dogs hate cats and why God isn't married. Oh boy. And they don't talk like visitors do which is hard to understand and when they read to us they don't skip words or mind if it's the same story over and over again everybody should try to have a grandma especially if you don't have television because grandmas are the only grown-ups who always have time oh, how sweet how sweet and so the influence of a grandparent cannot be overstated so we find that in Jacob's family, our next family, Hebrews eleven twenty one. 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons, these are his grandsons, and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. That word staff is probably his bedpost, the bedpost. Um, now Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, brother to Esau, he is now aged and he goes on to have ten sons. And his favorite son, Genesis 37, was number nine, Joseph. And that dysfunction, that sin of favoritism caused really a big problem in that family. Because his older brothers hated Joseph because dad was always giving him that, you know, that multicolored coat and that favoritism. And so his brothers actually wanted to kill him one day. His oldest brothers intervened, and so he ended up being sold to some Egyptian traders or some traders on the way to Egypt. And so Joseph, at the age of 17, became a slave in Egypt. And you can read all about his story in Genesis 37 through 15, how God blessed and protected Joseph as he grew up. And through a series of miraculous events, Joseph becomes number two in Egypt, in charge of all the food of Egypt. And that's when a famine struck and so in Palestine, people were needing food. Oh, Egypt had food. And so Jacob sends some of his boys to Egypt to buy grain. And there Joseph recognizes his brothers. His brothers had sold him into slavery. But he forgave them and they reconciled. And he says, is my father still alive? And they said, yes, bring him. And so Jacob brought the rest of the family into Egypt. And that's how the Israelites got into Egypt because of Joseph's care for them. And it says that near Jacob's time of death, Joseph brings his two sons, Manasseh, the firstborn, Ephraim, the secondborn. And naturally, he understands how the birthright order goes to the firstborn. And so he's guiding Manasseh toward um, uh, Jacob's right hand and Ephraim toward his left hand. And, and they're standing there, and all of a sudden, Jacob crosses his hands. And he puts his right hand on Ephraim's head, the second born, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, and utters this blessing. May the God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all of my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm. What a statement of faith that is. God who is unseen, my father's God, my grandfather's God, the God who is my shepherd, the one who has protected me from all harm. This God, may he bless these boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. And may they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And may they increase greatly upon the earth. And so Ephraim, the youngest, gets the firstborn blessing. But both of them are blessed. And both of them are added to the ten. Here's why we have 12 tribes of Israel. 
because Jacob had ten sons, and then he added Joseph's two sons. Ephraim and Manasseh, too, became heads of tribes. And that's why you have the twelve tribes of Israel instead of just ten, because of Joseph's two sons. It's an added blessing. And so this is the transition from a grandfather blessing the faith to his grandson. So the question again, do you have godly grandparents? Did you have any measure of faith that you received from them? And if you did, thank God for the blessing of faith that they transferred to you. So the story continues in the family of Abraham to Isaac, then to Jacob, then to Joseph. And they are in Egypt 400 years of life in Egypt. The people are now known as the Hebrew people because they believe in God. They believe that God cares. They believe that God has promises for them in the future that back in the promised land, the land of Canaan, that's still theirs, but they are now in Egypt and their population is such that the Pharaoh who knew not Joseph begins to oppress them and make them slaves and, and force them into hard labor, trying to diminish their population, but it did not work as God continued to bless them. And so one day the king, or the Pharaoh, uh, put out an edict. You can read all this in Exodus chapter 2. Um, and the word was, if any Hebrew family has a boy, they have to throw it into the Nile River, and it should be drowned. And that wasn't very successful. But it says here, that this happened in Moses' family. Again, this is centuries after the life of Joseph. You have, by faith, Moses, his parents, hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. I mean, what parent doesn't think that? <laughs> he was an extraordinary child, of course. And they were not afraid of the king's edict. And so you know the story. Moses is the third child. He has a brother named Aaron, three years older. He has an older sister named Miriam. Yeah, they throw him into the Nile. They do. They follow the spirit of the edict, but they put him in a waterproof basket. And they put him right in a place where bathing takes place frequently, in the bulrushes there. And they have Miriam, the sister, watching to see what's going to happen. And sure enough, by God's providence, Pharaoh's daughter comes down to, to bathe. And there she hears the baby crying and they get the basket out of the bulrushes. And instantly she falls in love and names the boy Moses, which means being drawn up out of water. And so instantly the older sister Miriam comes and says, do you need a nurse for the baby? Of course, of course. She gets Moses' mother. And so Moses' mother gets to train him and nurture him and pass on the faith to him. It doesn't say how many years that she had, but she had him for the first very, very critical years. I don't know if you saw the debate, uh, what was it, Friday night with the governor candidates. I'm not making a political comment here, but there was a question about universal preschool in that debate. And I'm not making a political statement about that either way. We have a preschool here. We do a good job with kids. But there were some st statistics, either by Delane Easton or another one, that said that the zero to five period in a child's life is like the most important period in a child's life. And that's the period of time that Moses' mother had him. And in those formative years, she taught him to believe in God. She taught him and instilled the Hebrew faith in him that God loves him and that God had promises that he was going to keep for him and his family. And Moses never forgot that. And it says that eventually he was brought into the house of Pharaoh and he was educated in the best of schools. All the science and math and everything was surrounded by incredible wealth, incredible Egypt culture. But one day, when he was 40 years old, that little sprout of faith that his mother had planted in him as an infant, as a one to five year old perhaps, began to grow. And it says, I'm no longer the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I am one with the Hebrew people and my God is their God. And I believe that. And that's a beautiful statement that faith is that strong. It is stronger than culture. It is stronger than even the Egyptian culture of the day and all the influences. So families take hope, take hope. Yes, our culture is strong, but faith is stronger still. Amen to that. Amen to that. We must believe that. Jennifer Hudson is a popular singer, and here's what she says. 
I've seen the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows and everything in between. But what my mother, my grandmother, and, the all, and all the powerful women in my family instilled in us is faith. And how to make it our own carries me through. It's like they are very much still here. And so she just makes this testimony as a contemporary woman today of saying she thanks her, her grandmother, her mother, and all the other women in her family for helping her find the faith. And it has been what she has needed through the ups and downs of life in our culture. So the lesson for this Mother's Day is this. Faith is to be passed on through families. Through families. We now understand why we call Abraham the father of the faith. Because it all started with him. Abraham. Father Abraham. The father of the faith. And he passed it on to Isaac. Who passed it on to Jacob. Who passed it on to Joseph. And Joseph passed it on to Moses' parents. And on and on. Generation to generation. To this very day. There's a book written called What is a Family? A lot of people have definitions for what is family. But Edith Schaefer gives a very concise answer to that. Family is a perpetual relay of truth. That's what it is. A perpetual relay of truth. One person, she says, in one family, in one village, in one country, in one nation, can even alone be the one to start the beginning of a new line of believers. And so she challenges us to think about the future. She says, imagine if one from every tribe, every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people being faithful, filled with faith, would hand off the flag of truth, not dropping out, but starting new families of faith right up until the motion, mo moment when Jesus comes back again. He is looking for people of faith, and there will be people of faith when Jesus returns because families have been faithful in passing it on generation to generation. So what about your family? If you want to serve faith up family style, there's three things that need to happen. One is that uh, we must develop a personal contagious confidence in God. In other words, you cannot pass on what you do not possess. So I want you to think about, do you believe in God? Do you believe that he cares for you? Do you believe that he has promises yet to be fulfilled in your life? This is where it begins. You cannot pass on a faith in God if you don't have one. And so I challenge you to kindle that faith again and again. Um, you cannot, in a race, complete the race if you don't pass on the baton. And you know what happens when the baton is dropped and some of you are on the verge of dropping the baton and it's not going to go to the next generation. And I urge you, please, please pick up the baton of faith so that you can pass it on to the next generation. That's the best way the faith is transferred from one generation to the next. Secondly, it has to do with our thinking. What happens between our ears? We must think of our homes as training bases and launching pads for sending children out of the world, not a storage facility isolating them from it. Remember the statistic that I quoted? 65,000 media messages in a teenager's life by the time they're 17. How many hours in church? 800. If you are counting on the church to do your job as a parent, guess what? Yeah, it's not going to happen. You cannot depend only on the church. And that's if you bring them every Sunday. And the average family is here twice a month, not every Sunday. So if your faith is going to be passed on, it's really going to be you parents and grandparents who do that. Because the church only gets an hour a week while they're growing up. And that's good. But it's not enough to over, overshoot the culture that we are living in. So parents, see your home. See your responsibilities for training your children. And it's a choice that you have to make. Make the choice to pass on the Christian faith. Sibling to sibling, parent to child, grandparent to grandchild. So 
one of my greatest privileges to have my grandchildren close by so that I can participate in their life. And we can teach them songs. We can pray with them. Teach them to fold their hands and pray at the table. You know, at two years old, they can do that. You know, tick, tock, hear the clock. Now it's time to pray, you know. Start there. And then be the example of love and care that they need to see from you. To be in your children's memories tomorrow, you must be in their lives today. So engage them and bring the conversations up about who God is and who Jesus is and pass the baton of faith. Mother's Day, this is it. Thank you, mothers, for being those kinds of people to us. Lord, we thank you again that we can be challenged and we see very clearly the pattern in Scripture. And it was even commanded in Deuteronomy 6 that parents are to pass on the simple belief in God and, 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 and the family values to the next generation at every possible moment, um, not just on a formal teaching moment. So we want to thank you for this challenge of Scripture today. And Lord, we're not perfect families. None of us are. And we have our dysfunctions. But the good news here in this passage is, is that even though these families were far from perfect, flat-out dysfunctional, the faith was still successfully passed. And then that encourages us because it is possible. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.